Hello and welcome to the Rural Doctors program. I'm Jerry Gannon and in this program we take a look at how modern life can impact your health. But before we begin, here's a quick word from Rural Health West CEO Belinda Bailey. Hi everyone and welcome to the final Rural Health West Rural Doctors broadcast for 2012. It's been a great lineup of topics in 2012 and we'd really like to thank you for being part of those broadcasts and, and watching them every month. We'd also like to let you know that there's a, a whole new lineup of programs being planned for 2013. The first of them will be in February and that'll all be about enabling telehealth at your practice, so make sure you have a look at that one. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank all of the rural doctors in Western Australia for the fantastic work that you do out there. You are really valued by your communities and you are very valued by the staff at Rural Health West. And on that note, I'd like to say I hope you and your families have a fantastic end to 2012 and that the new year brings you lots of good health and love and laughter and happiness and we'll look forward to seeing you in 2013. Thank you, Belinda. Now let's get started. Well, joining us today, we have Dr. Hugh Durham, who's a GP based in Bicton. Hi, Hugh. Welcome along. Good to see you again. We also have occupational therapist Jane Muirhead. Jane, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good to be here. And it's been a while since Olga Ward and I shared a panel together. Olga, nice to be back with you on a panel again. Likewise, Jerry. Mm, it's been Good a little to too, be back. too long. So today we're discussing modern life and how it can impact on us. Mm. One of the things I think that the patients worry about, perhaps more than anything, is their diet. And given that uh, diet is so much in the media these days, um, they have lots of questions for GPs, which obviously as GPs we don't always have the answers to and I suspect that the scientists don't always have the answers to either. So perhaps we could throw some of these topics around and see what people think. What about organic food? Is it healthier than just the run-of-the-mill stuff from Woolies? Um, what do you think? Well, I did. organic food is better in one way in that there are no pesticides and well, relatively little pesticides and herbicides in it and uh, other contaminants. Um, one study from, from Rutgers University showed that, bio, that uh, organic food had five times the level of minerals like magnesium and zinc in it, but that's not borne out by all studies. Those studies vary depending on who grows it. And in Australia, I believe an organic farmer is not allowed to put minerals in the soil in spite of the soil being deficient in several important ones. So I normally, if people ask me that question, I say, well, organic food is cleaner, but biodynamic food is probably better for you if it's grown on a relatively clean but not necessarily organic farm. So essentially, what's the difference between biodynamic and organic, Hugh? Biodynamic people are allowed to add anything to the soil like minerals, things that are lacking, and they're generally fairly clean, but they haven't gone to the expense of getting their plot certified as organic. Right. Whereas my impression of biodynamic was something about burying cow's horns at midnight. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have the impression from, uh, from looking at my garden shed where I, I grow sort of almost an organic garden is that a lot of my... Um, mineral supplements and trace elements that we have to put into our ancient soils in Australia because they've simply washed away over the gazillions of years that the continent's been here. Um, mm. And they, are, they, they carry a, a label that says Australian certified organic. So perhaps Australian organic farmers are able to add minerals. And are you a gardener, Jane? I have um, peaks and troughs of gardening. Last year was a good year, this year is a very poor year. But I, I think, look, I would tend to say, because um, working with chronic illnesses, I do get asked about diet, uh, that my, my preference would be, like you, for organic or bio, biodynamic, but uh, that if it's a case of just generally eating more vegetables and fruit, our society doesn't eat enough of those anyway. Mm. It's the preference is just eat more of them and be pragmatic about that. So uh, for some people it's expensive, more expensive, and people on low incomes, mm. it's just better that they eat more fruit and vegetables. Are, are we making too much of this, the difference between organic and conventionally um, produced vegetables? Hugh? Um, I don't think it. I don't think it's vital. I think there's a small advantage to eating organic. It depends on your genetics and how good uh, how good your system is. It mm. is it removing toxins, and some people are better than others. Everybody knows the 
the example of the 20 tonne bridges that were built and, and uh, 22 tonne trucks were being driven across them in relation to how much you drink and whether your liver is going to cave in. Yes. So the first two bridges collapse when the 22 tonne trucks go and another f a few bridges survive a few years and two bridges last forever with 30 mm. tonne trucks growing over them. And, and genetics is a nice segue to your next point, Olga, isn't it? Well, it is. But people have been breeding genes in and out of plants over generations forever, really, to, to get bigger, brighter and better roses or... Mm. Um, and the carrot is an example. That is a genetically the, engineered the, vegetable. The orange carrot instead it's of the purple carrot. I have to say, I think mm. the yellow ones not, are the not yummies. not quite the same genetic engineering as, as engineering a pesticide into a potato. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. So there's genetically modified and there's genetically modified. So what is your point exactly? Is it all GM is bad well, or some GM is bad? I would be highly suspicious of any modern GM. But what do we know? And I wouldn't eat it myself. Sure, but what evidence is there, Hugh, or have enough tests been done to monitor the effects of consuming genetically modified canola, for instance? We only do two things in Australia, um, cotton and canola. Um, is it that we don't know enough, or...? Well, there was genetically modified cotton introduced into India, and mostly poor farmers who owned one bullock and the bullocks ate the genetically modified cotton and died. The, the Monsanto then approached the farmers with the following year's seed because they genetically modify these things so that the seed doesn't propagate. And so they have to buy the seed at four times the price that they would ordinarily mm -hmm. pay. So number one, they lost their bullock. Number two, they couldn't afford the seed. Jane. I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them with two broken arms. Jane, what's your, <laughs> I, I take it you're a Guinness, you. Um, what's, your, what's your view, Jane, on, on GM food? I don't know. I think there's something, something just feels intuitively wrong about a fish crossed with a tomato. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like... The what? imagination boggles. Which one was wearing the net <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that there are, there are potentially repercussions because of very much the things Hugh's talking about, greed mm. and profit. Sure. Um, and, and many of the unfortunate things that have happened with the genetically modified um, end crop have been quite unpredictable and unexpected. Mm. So how can we tell that although those things, some of things have been picked up in the short term on, on preliminary testing, how can we tell mm. that we're not going to have something unpredictable happen so, yes, in so the marketplace five years down the but, track. But we're already consuming genetically modified foods. We just don't know it. Many of our produced foods in the supermarkets carry traces or bits of genetically produced foods. I would prefer not to do it if I knew. Yeah, and I, and I think that's one of the issues that the, the anti-GM lobby is talking about, is making sure that labelling yeah. Yeah. clearly carries it. But, but the fact is, I believe that many of our processed foods already carry traces or some GM produced foods. Well, mm -hmm. Certainly for myself, I keep processed food intake to an absolute minimum. Well, I think that's good advice all mm -hmm. around. Anyway, natural is. is always yeah. best, Olga. Well, you know, arsenic is 100% natural, Jerry. <laughs> 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 well, what about some other things that people worry about? Why do people say that microwaving foods is dangerous? It's something about cooking from the inside out. It's a bit like the fish and tomato issue, I think. It's just the right. idea of... Um, but surely you're just jiggling the water molecules with a microwave, it yes? It could well be. Well, it's I do. No, there is good evidence that microwaving destroys flavones at a far faster rate than boiling or steaming. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it, it's, all, all it is is electromagnetic energy. That's true, but if you're talking about flavones, just look at broccoli. Mm. Broccoli is known to contain some substances that are protective against a prostate cancer. But those substances are all flavones. So if you microwave your broccoli, it no longer protects you against prostate cancer. Well, why would you do that anyway? You would only microwave things that you want to reheat, really. Or my porridge. I cook my porridge in the microwave. It's very easy to cook your veggies in the microwave, too. So, so if you so microwave them, they're less you. beneficial. It won't kill you, but it's not as good as. Not as good as. Nowhere near as good as. No. Yeah. And you may be destroying the, the reason that you're eating the vegetables right. in the first place. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, Related to that are those the types of containers in which we microwave, which are often made of quite malleable plastics. And I know there's been quite a considerable number of write-ups in some of the popular magazines about not feeding your baby out of a malleable plastic bottle and not using the plastic 
um, reusable um, water bottles mm. for your water. So yeah. everyone's going for the, there's a simple stainless test you can steel do. and glass now. You can pour a glass full of water out of one of those plastic bottles and then leave it for a week and then smell it. Mm. Do you want that stuff inside of you? So how much of the plastic comes out in the water? Because I had a plastic bottle for two years, which was me being a conservationist. I had a plastic bottle for two years until I discovered that it's not good to be drinking out of plastic. The plastic breaks down as you use it. Yes. If you leave the water in, I agree with you, it tastes quite plasticky. But, <laughs> but it has been left in from the factory till the time it's bought mm. by you in the supermarket. And how long is that? Mm. A week? A month? Who knows? But there are lots of things we don't know. But, it, but it's, all about, it's all about acceptable risk, isn't it, Hugh? Life is about acceptable risk. I, I, I could, I could re completely remove the risk of being killed in a car crash tonight by not driving home my car. Yeah. But it's the same as drinking water from a bottle, isn't it? It's an acceptable risk. Uh, yeah, I drink water from a bottle when there's nothing else, but when there isn't a choice, then I don't do it. Yeah, OK. Another definitive answer to that Another question. definitive answer. <laughs> Well, perhaps we'll all have to go for eau de tap in a glass, which is... Uh, yeah. Well-filtered water in a glass, yes. Yeah. I, I have yeah. a, jug, a jug and I've now got a metal um, flask uh -huh. for my... And a metal jug? Mine is filtered into a plastic jug, but it's non-malleable. It's a harder plastic. It's a hard harder, plastic. harder plastics are much less volatile. Yeah. Sounding we're good. We're doing good so far, Olga. We're doing really well, we aren't we? We've got 144 questions. We're, we're up to number three. <laughs> we're about up to number three. <laughs> well, let's talk about milk for the South West, uh, for the South West viewers. Raw milk, pasteurised milk, homogenised milk, A2 milk. What's good or not good about it? And what is permeate? <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on raw milk because I grew up on a farm where we produce milk. So you're looking at me saying, so that's what happened to you. That's it, yes. Um, well, it. yes, except so, I'm sort of staying a bit quiet leader. because <laughs> <laughs> we, used to, we used to milk our, uh, milk our friend's cow. <laughs> um, these days, I think it's generally accepted that raw milk is not good for you, that there are harmful There are greebles in it. A, a vet of my acquaintance feeds her kids on raw milk, but she says she knows the farmer, she knows the herd, she knows the, the ground they're on, she knows it's clean, and so that's fine. But... Otherwise, unless you have that level of knowledge, it's safer to have it pasteurised, for sure. The Centre for Disease Control uh, and Prevention states that between 93 and 2006, more than 1,500 people in the US became sick from drinking raw milk or eating cheese made from raw milk. They also reported that pa unpasteurised milk is 150 times more likely to cause foodborne illness and results in 13 times more hospitalisations than illness involving pasteurised dairy products. Yeah, well, you certainly wouldn't be recommending that for your pregnant women, would you? No. Well, it's the same as this A2 milk. That's a marketing ploy. No, that's a health ploy. Well, my, my, <laughs> my research here <laughs> suggests that there is no difference between A1 or A2 milk. There is a significant difference. With an extra 250 a litre? There's, there's, there's an amino acid eight, in position eight from one end of the protein and the last seven amino acids polypeptide can break off and form a caseomorphine in our bodies which mm -hmm. in some people makes them dopey, some people makes them constipated, some people makes them sick in the tummy and uh, those people, they can try the A2 milk and it suits them and the A1 milk is not good. Is it, it's, is quite, it, it's quite common. How much Olga, 250 a litre or more? I think so, yeah. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, that's pretty rare. But my, my, the little research I did says, quote, there is no consensus that A2 milk has benefits over A1 milk. You disagree with that, obviously. Absolutely. Jane, do you have a Some view quite on good evidence. A1 or A2 milk? Well, I certainly, th I certainly think a l quite a few people do actually get complaints from milk. So, you know, bloating and stomach complaints. Um, so I think, uh, again, it's... Some individuals are fine, mm. Mm. and others, uh, you mm. know, it's like gluten. There's yes. many, many people who are gluten intolerant. So it's your ability oh, no. to process it. It's a ability to process. Mm. Uh, A2 is the protein part mm. of the milk, so it's it's a casein, casein or it's a casein, it's a casein. Mm. Yeah, it's a casein. protein. Mm. 
Um, I whereas think I think a lot of the bloaters also are lactose intolerant. Mm. The first thing I always suggest to them, which at least is a, a cheaper alternative, is if they wish to continue to drink milk or um, eat significant amounts of dairy products, that they simply try some lactose enzyme supplement. Um, like a Yakult or something? No, no, mm. like lactose. Um, you can actually buy the enzyme in a little bottle right? from the chemist or in a tablet, which tastes unfortunately oh, oh. like peppermint flavoured chalk. Um, <laughs> without a prescription? Or without without a wrong. prescription, just mm. over the counter. You just and ask the pharmacy. Uh, allow that them allows to people who are lactose it. intolerant mm. to, um, to process um, the sugar in the milk, which oh. is the lactose, mm. which of course ferments in the large bowel and produces the delightful gas. Um, these are the normal people in the world who are of Mediterranean or Asian origin rather than the uh, other fair individuals around me who are not. Northern <laughs> well, the, the lactose intolerance in Western <laughs> Europeans, who are the dairy tolerant part of the world apart from West Africa, uh, East Africa, um, is estimated that something like 30 or 40 mm, percent are high. intolerant of lactose as adults. It, it's a normal human thing to become lactose intolerant. You don't drink breast milk as an adult. The, the only humans who were designed for <laughs> drinking milk are babies. And then in societies where dairy hasn't been a big thing, like China, for instance, by the time five or six years old rolls past, they become lactose intolerant mm. and 95% of Chinese are intolerant yeah. of lactose. But it's quite different, as you say, from a cow's milk protein. But allergy or intolerance, yeah, which, which produces often quite similar symptoms. So it's probably worth telling the patients to try out both. Mm -hmm. How long would you try it, do you think, Hugh, before you actually got an effect, like before you noticed whether or not it was making a difference? Uh, probably three weeks for milk. So you could so say to people to get kind of buy, you know, three lots of two litres and if it didn't work, then don't persist in wasting mm -hmm. money. Well, if, if, if a patient or a kid in particular presents with constipation, I'd say, well, and one thing you could try is A2 milk. Mm -hmm. And often enough, it, it relieves the constipation and the kid no longer has a problem. Or what about just not taking milk at all for a period? Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a, for my patients who are unwell or fatigued in particular, I, I put them on a diet trial where they have no fructose, no cow's milk products, and no fructans, which is wheat, rye, artichokes, onions, leeks, capsicum and asparagus. And then they going off all of that stuff and then reintroducing it after three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. Right. And, they, and when they have a reaction to something, they put then that you, on the banned list. That's right, OK. Yeah. Now, other things, particularly Jane, which your patients must ask you about. Artificial sweeteners. The, they cause everything, according to the Women's Weekly. They do. At various and times. I, you know, again, I don't... Uh, I mean, I, I'm not overly keen on artificial sweeteners, if only for the fact that they actually taste revolting as an aftertaste That's in what the mouth, I think. metallic. Yeah, metallic. But I think, you know, there's some nasty stuff around about aspartame, and uh, you know, sugar's not good either. <laughs> Too much of it. So, I think it's a case of of balance again, and I, I think there's an awful lot of drinks that are being consumed by children diet stuff. with diet. Yeah, I, you know, diet, diet this coke diet, is that and and you know, extra caffeine, huge terrifying. amounts of diet diet drinks, which mm. are just really like coloured yeah. chemical water. Absolutely, oh, I agree with you. And there's a large study done in the US very recently showed that people having the diet drinks actually get fatter than the people having the regular stuff. What causes that, Hugh? The Theoretic other chemicals. Theoretical arguments. Uh, certainly, it's known that um, the excretion of insulin is not solely dependent on the sugar in the stomach. Yeah. You know, people can be measured to excrete insulin when they're about to eat something. Sure. And it's probable that people excrete insulin when they get a sweet taste in their mouth. Well, okay. So we may be promoting insulin resistance with artificial mm. sweeteners. But sugar versus artificial sweeteners, if you have to have something sweetened, what would your advice be? I'd have sugar. Yeah, same here. Raw sugar as opposed to processed sugar? No difference, really. No difference. But an in interesting uh, sea captain that I was uh, acquainted with was piloting sugar ships. And she said she's at the wharf and they're unloading the sugar ships and the fruit bats are swinging off the cranes and pooping into the sugar. <laughs> and then the wharfies go down the ladder to shovel out the last bit and there's no toilet down there, so they piss into the sugar. So she never touches the stuff. <laughs> never touches the stuff. <laughs> White sugar is cleaner, for the reason. <laughs> it's a bit 
sound like chocolate, supposedly. I don't yes. know if it's an urban myth, yeah, allowed right. a certain amount of cockroach. In That's it. right. Yeah. 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 It, it, it gives so it Harry Potter and the cockroach <laughs> clusters it gives it a is not just a... Jane. Yeah. <laughs> what what about... Even a fructose intolerant person can tolerate a certain amount of sugar, sugar. Mm -hmm. because sugar, of course, is equally balanced fructose glucose. Yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate that person have two sugars in their tea and coffee, yeah. but they could probably stand three teaspoons in a day. What are people going on about when they start talking about superfoods? Well, superfoods are foods that have high nutrient value or high, high nutrient density. Um, a few off the top of my head, berries, chia seeds, spices, uh, sweet potato, avocado, um, parsley, coriander, brassica vegetables, there's a PhD nutritionist in Utah running a clinic where she treats cancer patients and she has quite a number of studies, Jeannie Wallace, she has quite a number of studies showing that mostly just modifying people's diets, she's vastly increasing their life expectancies. Wow. And oncologists are now referring people to her clinic. And, and, and she specialises in superfoods, or that, that's yeah. the, the basis of her treatment? She's produced a, a list of superfoods, one to keep your genes healthy, one to modify your oestrogens, one to reduce angiogenesis, one to reduce your blood sugars, and one as anti-inflammatory. Okay, so they're not just antioxidant-rich foods? They mostly are, yes. They mostly are? Yeah. Jane, is this something that you come across frequently in your work? Um, <clears throat> It, well, they, they go through periods of popularity as to whatever has been mentioned in, Woman's in the Day. press. <laughs> yes. well, Woman's Day. Um, maybe Woman's Day, but the press generally. <laughs> However, I do have a lot of faith in, um, in the research around these foods and have seen and have experienced myself really good results with you know, modifying my diet with foods that are antioxidant rich and we can call them superfoods. and. You know, people can think that if they live on them, then they'll cure every disease under the sun. But again, it's moderation. Uh, it's mm. looking at what foods are more beneficial, what the evidence is, and then eating more of them. But you can still have your chocolate brownie from time well, to time. Well, the population <laughs> studies show it's not eating lots and lots of one superfood. Right, it's having balance. a large variety of foods, yeah. seasonal fresh foods. In Okinawa, for instance, there are commonly 80 different foods that are seasonally changing throughout their diet. And in most of our diets, there's about 20. Mm. Sounds like something that would be worthwhile for the patients to oh. investigate and mm, yeah. decide for themselves. Are we still on food or well, will we, we can food? we can move on to something else if mm. you would like to move on to something else. How about cobalt toxicity? Well, how about cobalt toxicity? This was actually a... Um, Four Corners did something. Well, Four Corners it? did something on this and uh, I actually chased it up in the Medical Journal of Australia, and there's a 2011 report um, on metal-on-metal metal hip replacements. And uh, in two cases, the patients who'd received these metal-on-metal metal hip replacements, which I think must contain some kind of alloy that is titanium and cobalt, mm. um, had developed and again, the symptom descriptors are quite vague and I was a little annoyed with the medical journal because I thought, I'm sure they've edited out some of the, the stuff that I really wanted to know, which, which was they had some cognitive decline, but it wasn't really quantified, mm -hmm. and aches and pains and um, fatigue and depression. And once the hip, like when their hip replacements were investigated, the, the joint fluid was absolutely stacked full of cobalt and so were the tissues around and it seems that it had caused quite a bit of um, bone reabsorption around where the replacement had been put in and once they'd replaced the replacement with something that was ceramic um, the patient's symptoms went away and uh, and their cobalt toxic blood levels disappeared down to normal but what does it do to you if you become Cobalt, cobalt toxic. toxic. Well, it sounds to me as if it makes you depressed and dopey. But these are all inflammatory processes as well. I mean, these are like we know, now know with, with depression, chronic pain, diabetes, they all have an inflammatory component. And I would guess if there was a foreign body in there that was the body was not happy with and was, you know, giving out this substance, in leaking the substance into the tissue, that 
that an inflammatory process within the body could cause all of those symptoms, mm. Mm. Um, al along with a lot of chronic health conditions. So it wouldn't surprise me. Yes. And, and are these um, hips made of titanium and cobalt still available? Are they still being used? I think that they are not <coughs> any more used yes. in Australia, and I'm pretty sure that they've been banned in the States before some enormous class action adds a lot of zeros onto people's payouts. Mm. Um, what I'm not sure of is you know, a lot of our elderly patients have had hip replacements and a lot of them are a bit depressed and a bit demented and a bit dopey and a lot fatigued. So in other words, how can you tell the difference how between their normal state and their hip yes, replacement? Yes, how, how do you know whether it's coming from their hip replacement? Have you mm. seen any of this type of Can you do a blood test for patient? cobalt can toxicity? You, it, it, I, I would imagine that somehow you'd be able to find out what type of hip replacement they had, but I don't know how you would do that. Um, mm. <clears throat> I think probably as a GP I'd be contacting my my local pathology company and saying, look, I've got this patient who I think might have a metal-on-metal metal hip replacement. Mm. I would like to do their serum cobalt level because, you know, these mm. patients that, that were written up in the MJA had astronomical levels. It wasn't just like, you know, 21 instead of 20. It was like 2050 instead mm. of 20. Mm. It That's was huge. It was really striking. Yeah. Um, and it appears in the CSF as well. Mm. So it, uh, you know, it definitely sounds pretty toxic stuff. Now, speaking of um, on a, a related subject, copper, uh, um, too much copper ain't good. Um, but there are a lot and of... Mo most of us in most of Australia are copper, copper overloaded. I, I read that. that that's mm. interesting. Why, why is that? Where, where is because this the from? soil and the food supply are deficient in molybdenum and zinc, which are two of copper's main antagonists. Which is the sort of thing, but, but where does the copper come from in the first place, Hugh? In our diet. Just, yeah, right. We're not eating an abnormal amount, or eating or drinking an abnormal amount of copper in most cases. It's just there's insufficient and zinc and molybdenum to, to chase it away It's not again. being balanced. Yes, okay. All right. So the copper comes and lodges in the liver and there's not enough to, there's not enough molybdenum and zinc to chase it away again, so it just accumulates in the liver. I know of one farmer whose sick was, sheep were sick and dying and he had an autopsy done on one and the liver was just choked with copper. So he sprayed his pasture with 25 grams of molyb sodium molybdate per hectare and the sheep's wee turned green and the pasture they were weeing on turned brown and they all got up and started getting healthy again. <laughs> we don't have the same remedies for humans. Um, we do. Do we? Yeah. You what? can wee on the pasture all your life. <laughs> <laughs> This discussion is degenerating somewhat, <laughs> but it's good fun, it's good fun. But Olga was asking you the question about the number of, of doctors testing for copper. Why is that? Well, because I think we don't, as a general rule. Right. I think if you really suspected somebody of having Wilson's disease, you really would test their copper levels, but mm. general practitioners don't I've only normally ever test copper levels. I've seriously suspected one and she tested negative anyway. Right, mm. okay. Now, apart from blood tests, what, what value do you place on hair tests, testing hair? I, I do hair tests all the time. They're absolutely invaluable for telling somebody's uh, mineral toxicities and their mineral balance. So here, how, how does it not show up, the three different brands of hair dye that I've used in the last six months, um, plus the current shampoo that I've uh, just washed my hair with yesterday? Well, which, what do they contain? Well, I'm presuming that... Um, hair dyes, particularly the permanent ones, contain quite a number of metals and toxins. And uh, I know, the only one I know of for sure is the black content. ones contain lead. Uh -huh. And we had, uh, I did one hair test on a lady whose whose lead was quite high, and then we tested, we did a retest when she'd got rid of the dye and tested it on virgin hair, and the but the lead level was still half as high and still significant, so it made a difference, but it wasn't overriding. The police use it as well to test for the presence of drugs, illicit drugs, do they not? I've heard so. I, the only one I ever look at are mineral tests. Mm. But it depends on how high up the chain you go. There's a professor of pathology I ask about various things. He's got research uh, friends all around the world. And when I asked him about hair testing, he said, he, he said, oh, it's very interesting. I've got friends doing research on it in Chicago and London and this place and that place and the other. And it's telling us lots of interesting things. But if you ask the average... GP or specialist, as far as they're concerned, that's just something that naturopaths dabble in. So they really don't know. But for you, it's a useful tool Absolutely. to measure the level of, of essential um, yeah. uh, elements. I can tell at a glance if a person's mercury toxic, for instance. Mm. All right. 
We might take a break though. We are talking about the effects of modern life on our health and many of us spend time in our offices. Many of us spend time slouching in our offices and sitting in bad chairs. Jane's got some advice for us in this piece that she recorded earlier this week. Hi Jane, welcome to the program. Thank you, hi. Um, can you first of all just talk us through the basic setup of an office space or a consultation space for a GP? Yeah, sure. Well let's look first at the, the computer. Mm -hmm. um, obviously for GPs, luckily there isn't hours and hours usually of typing at a screen, but it's still really important to have that set up correctly. Mm -hmm. Now just looking at you, you are actually a little bit too high. Mm -hmm. um, and so really ideally we would be raising this and I often say to people if you're doing it on a on a sort of budget then uh, telephone books are really good so we want to raise this up a little bit so essentially your eyes are about four-fifths of the way down the screen mm -hmm. yeah. so we really want something that's that's set up so that your eyes can scan from right to left and up and down without a, a huge amount of head movement. Having said that, we don't want your head held rigidly because that is actually also going to cause problems. Yeah. So coming, coming to the keyboard here, arms should be, you see this is where we have a problem with you because you actually need to raise your seat a little bit so that your arms are exactly at right angles. Um, and that's about right, but then you can see how you're too high for the screen. <laughs> so everybody's body, you know, bodies aren't made to fit into technology. We need to try and fit technology to work with bodies, and that's always the dilemma we have. Now looking at you there, yeah, you, you've, you've got a reasonable angle um, of your arms and your shoulders. So that would be a fairly correct way of typing. Having said that, you don't want to be typing for hours on end because mm. as you can see your your wrists are resting there. Now that underside of the rest, wrist, as GPs will all know, has you know got a lot of nerves in there mm -hmm. that can get constricted and we don't want pressure on them for too long. I'm not a great one for wrist supports even though you, you can use them and some of the softer ones can be okay but they're still you know, they're still causing pressure on the, the lower part of the arm. I would rather people mm. stopped regularly. And luckily for GPs as well, they're actually in and out of the chair a lot more absolutely. than people might think. You know, absolutely. A physical consult or just taking someone's height or collecting them from the, you know, the, the waiting yeah. room or whatever yeah. it is. It, it, it has a lot of pluses from an ergonomic point of view being mm. a GP. <laughs> so when, when it comes to the mouse, one of the common problems I see, and I've done it myself many times, so I know is the mouse is often too far away from the body. And mm -hmm. the person is sort of leaning. And I don't know why that happens, but it often happens with people is that they sort of sit sideways in the seat, grab the mouse, and particularly if you're doing something quite quickly. So you might have been working with a, with a patient, and you come to the computer and you sort of grab the mouse, and you know, it's very easy to be a bit lopsided. Mm -hmm. um, again, with the telephone, you want that to be closer to the body. You don't want to be, you know, straining to reach anything. Now, what about the position of the patient? Because essentially it means that there's the multiple points of focus. And I know yep. that GPs are there constantly back and forth. The yeah. Patient, yeah. And, and, and that's, a, that's a good thing in many ways. Because, as you can see, if you're leaning a bit towards that side of the body and then you swivel around to face the patient, you're at least getting some you know, some movement happening. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about sitting that I'm, I'm very keen that people are aware of is this, this whole concept of sitting up straight. But if we actually look at the body, do you want to stand up for mm -hmm. me, son? If we actually look at the body, so what we have here, uh, if you don't mind me touching you, mm -hmm. we have the curves of the lumbar spine and you've actually got some nice curves there so we can see that. So the spine's a lovely curving, um, very, very clever, dynamic, rod if you like with all these interspaces that that really work for us very well mm -hmm. what we don't want is to get into bracing or sitting in such a way that we lose those lumbar curves so this idea of sitting straight is a bit of a a, a misnomer as I said most GPs will know this this lovely little gel cushion um, I've done quite a bit of research to try and find cushions that uh, allow movability the body needs to move all the time, all the time we're adjusting posture and adjusting our position. Mm -hmm. And again, we tend to sit very much on our thighs when we're sitting in a, in a chair. So if you'd like to sit down for me here, because mm -hmm. um, this illustrates it quite nicely, and, and just sort of, 
your posture's too good. Really. <laughs> Sit as if you'd been sitting there for an hour or okay. so, okay? So what you're doing is you're actually enhancing this curve here mm -hmm. and slumping into the low, yep. the low back. The other thing that people do is they round over like that. And that is extremely common. And you, you start to get this forward movement of the head that can become quite habituated. I would say that if anyone's brave enough, take a look at yourself in the mirror and, <laughs> and um, with not much on and look at where your curves are and, and, and where your head movements are because this actually tells us a lot. So if we actually then from this position try and turn our head to the left and the right and see that there's yeah. quite a lot of constriction movement. If you come forward in your seat and you just meet, sit on the edge of the seat, see if you can change, that's right, that's it. See if you've got more range of movement in your neck. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So we've already, you can feel that? Yeah. Yeah. So sitting forward in our seat actually gives us a better tilt to the pelvis, mm -hmm. which allows for that. However, that also gets tiring. So here comes our little friend, which as you can see, has this slight tilt, which will naturally give us a tilt in the pelvis. I'm gonna get you to try this. So that's tilting the pelvis just a little bit forward, which is allowing us to keep <laughs> I can feel it already. And you can move around. <laughs> and so you're giving yourself a little bit of exercise at the same time. Now, everybody's body's different. I happen to like those. There are different, different models. But what I would really stress to, to anyone who's doing a fair bit of sitting is to just be aware of the need to keep this, this natural curve of the spine happening throughout the whole of the spine and this tilting, tilting, slightly tilting the pelvis forward, not huge amounts, otherwise we'll all slide off our chairs, mm. but, but tilting it forward slightly does allow particularly the lumbar curve where most of us actually can get, can get problems from the constriction of the vertebrae there. And our thanks to Jane Muirhead for some uh, tips and tricks to keep moving healthily in our office. Jane will be back a little bit later with some more advice on stretching. But now, back to Jane, actually, for our, we're going back to food to talk about fats, and we know that they clog our arteries, but we also believe, do we not, that they can be possibly carcinogenic? Well, there does seem to be mounting evidence to that, and um, one thing that really struck me was a study that I found recently that, um, it was a French study in the American Journal of Epidemiology in 2008, that uh, the risk of breast cancer doubles in women with a high trans fat intake so and there are many many other studies that was just one that I've just discovered recently and I think I think the uh, there's going to be more and more on that issue as the years go by uh, because I think it, it makes sense that if something affects one area of our body it's quite likely to actually be affecting mm. another and these inflammatory mm. processes we were discussing earlier that are so implicated in in so many diseases now but Jane, how would a patient know a trans fat when they met it? Well, nowadays, I think most um, food labels, and Hugh, you may know this, or correct me if I'm wrong, I have to actually put down how much trans fat is there. So, so they usually just put fat content, no, no, total and now, saturated fat? There's more and more things that are actually saying zero trans fats. You know, it's actually becoming a bit like the superfoods and other marketing things. So I think there is a much more awareness that the trans fats are, mm. are really not good for if us. If you just had to give a patient a blanket information about trans fats, what sort of foods would you tell them to avoid? Well, when the oils are, are hardened, particularly in, so in many biscuits. That's and right. I mean, Peter Dingle says his little maxim is never spread anything that congeals the room temperature. Yeah, I know. And if you look at margarine, I compare my butter and my margarine. Mm. The margarine's been there sort of four months. My husband likes margarine. I keep trying to get him off it. Um, and it, it's still lovely and plasticky and new looking and the butter goes rancid much more quickly. So to me, I think foods that are, are more alive and more vital are probably going to go off quicker. Yes. Uh, but the one that I use, the margarine that I use, is the olive oil one, the one that's made with olive oil. Am I kidding myself? Am I kidding myself? Uh, do a butter butter olive oil com comparison and see look how it goes. Look at the label and see how much trans fats is in it. A lot Never of them are... I just pick it up off the shelf and put it in the basket. Yeah, I'll do that. Take it. <laughs> there, <laughs> there Whereas are, I've got one of those whizzy things, so I just make margarines. butter. <laughs> in the early days when margarines came out, they were thinking, oh, well, get people off the butter and onto margarine and they, and they won't die of heart disease anymore. No, they didn't, but they died of gallbladder disease and cancer instead. But the death rate didn't alter. 
It's just you died of something different. Swapped. <laughs> but nowadays with modern margarines where the trans fats have been reduced, that's probably no longer true. However, mm. it's probably wiser not to spread too much. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't spread. I have toast once a week. And if, if, you're going to, if you're going to, well, in our house when we cook with oil as far as possible, we make it olive, olive oil, oil which is, which is the most resistant oil. to high temperatures. Yeah. What about grapeseed oil? There's been a big touting about that being quite resistant to high temperatures as well. Is that one? I don't know. Because I went straight out and bought some here. Yeah. <laughs> Marketing goes straight in there. Oh, look, here's the grapeseed oil. So that, that little bit of scientific <laughs> evidence you found in Woman's Day. <laughs> be it. I don't read Woman. <laughs> well, we'll have to I have read a look Scientific and... American, thank you. <laughs> Oh, we'll have a little look. Well, earlier you, you mentioned mercury and mm. I was thinking that one of the other things that the patients sometimes um, become very twitchy about is the mercury in their old amalgam fillings. Um, and I suppose I should be a bit twitchy about it since I've got a mouth full of those, although they're rapidly becoming covered with gold as my um, dentist's daughter's pony um, is accommodated. <laughs> <laughs> and her is, that, is that where your superannuation is going? <laughs> That's pretty much it. Does mercury really come out of amalgam fillings in, Ab in everyone? And absolutely. why is it a problem in only some people? It's been proven that mercury comes out as a vapour out of amalgam fillings with heat, with pressure and with brushing. And guess what's quite close is the cribriform plate, so it goes straight to the brain. OK, I'll stop grinding my teeth right now. Why is it only a problem in a few people? Or am it's I kidding myself in, and I'm actually going bonkers? It's a problem in lots bonkers. of people. In one general practice in New Zealand, they clinically identified over 800 people who were mercury toxic. They proved it by giving them an intravenous chelation challenge with DMPS and excreting lots of mercury to prove it was there. And then they chelated them orally with DMSA for 12 months. So the patients started off with faulty memory, anxiety, depression, salivation, tremor, uh, uncoordination and a few other things that I forget off the top Just of my head. Bad hangover, really. And uh, they've been told that they were crazy or they were stressed or this or that or the other. And once they've been chelated for 12 months and all of those symptoms went away, the thing that mostly pissed them off is that the previous doctors hadn't picked up on it. Uh, is there permanent damage? There's 800 patients out of a single New Zealand practice. Mm. Is there permanent damage to be had from mercury poisoning? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So yeah. some of these things yeah. at times Just will not be reversed? Destroys neurons. Well, I know the Elizabethans destroyed their faces, didn't they, with mercury face powder, but, uh, but even surely... When even when you destroy neurons, all is not lost because of neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. So, really, I can continue to grind my teeth and I'll be uh, a little I'm, bit I'm, safe? I'm, I'm having my amalgams all removed, thanks very much, and I'm taking chelating agents and antioxidants while I'm having it done. You're a bit of a belt and braces man, Hugh. Oh, well, it. if you have them taken out and you're not protected at the time, it just goes straight into your brain via the dentist's chair. Yeah. Really? Yeah. While, it, while so it's being taken out? I had a, a, a moderate I'd... chronic fatigue patient who had six amalgams taken out at one time. It made her so much worse she spent the next six weeks in bed. Good Lord. But why, don't, why aren't our dentists dying of mercury poisoning from... Or you don't usually die of it. Going nuts or demented or... But people are often anxious or have faulty memories or... All uh -huh. the subtle little things uh -huh. that people often write down to age. So this might just explain the suicide rate amongst dentists. I think it's really tricky, isn't it? Because so much is put down to, to sort of this uh, nebulous stress, sort of, you know, all, all of these things are related to stress. And we do have a huge amount in our fast-paced society of stress. Mm. And so trying to pull those bits apart can be very difficult. I've found with the complexity of the issues that I see with people is keeping an open mind. And I will send people back to the doctor and say, get this check, get this check, get this check, so that we can at least rule those things out rather than going straight to its stress. Mm. So I think it's, it's really keeping that openness um, and, and awareness of mm. what's going on. And while you've got the chair, this seems like an ideal opportunity to introduce your next segment. Where Tell us what you're going to do in this next segment. Well, the next segment is uh, really just looking at stretches and movements that we can do during the day. Um, we've all been sitting here for an hour and a half now and I can see Olga's wanting to stretch and move. Our bodies are made to move and uh, GPs luckily have a job that's probably easier to move in than some other professions but still, so a bit of advice from both my OT and my yoga background. <laughs> Jane, everybody's busy and no one's busier than rural GPs. Mm. The idea of us 
um, taking significant amounts of time to go and do formal exercise routines or take a long walk or it's actually very unrealistic. So what are the things that we can do within the space yeah. quickly and easily yeah. to help us? Just cope with the day. Yeah, cope yeah. with the day, exactly. Oh, well, I've sort of learned this myself having sat through working with patients throughout a day and finding that tension would build up and build up and often at the end of the day my body would be very tight and mm -hmm. sore and I would be feeling, you know, like I've got a headache coming on and I'm sure this is something that all health practitioners who deal with, you know, one patient after another very quickly can, can get into at times. So, you know, again, the breath, our breath is really important. Uh, often when we're dealing with a lot of patients, one after another, complex issues, we can be breathing quite fast and shallow in the chest and not, aw not aware of, of that. So one of the things that I'll often do is bring my awareness, even while I'm talking to someone, to where's my breath in the body and can I just perhaps deepen that slightly, bring it more to the navel and allow for some relaxation in, in the uh, the muscles around the rib cage that can tighten up and constrict breathing. Another thing that I really advocate is micro breaks. So in between clients, if the body is getting tight, there are things we can do to, to unravel ourselves a little bit. Um, and they take seconds. And once we get them habituated, as I say, I often say to my clients, do you clean your teeth every morning? They look at me shocked and they say, well, you know, why can't we learn to do these little things that are helpful throughout the day that will just stop our whole musculoskeletal and nervous system going into a, a wound up mode? There's a, there's a couple of very simple things that I'd love to show you. So the, the first one is, and um, you know, sometimes we might think this is a little bit of a strange thing to do, but some days we feel like doing this, is to just put your arms down on the like, yeah, cross over your arms and then just lean your forehead onto your arms and bring the body forward mm -hmm. into a stretch. That's it. And just feeling the breath into the, the, the back of the body. If you're very supple, you can bring, bring yourself right down to the ground. So if you, if you just watch me here, you can actually just come right down. Head lower than the heart and take a couple of deep breaths. And that's filling up the back of the lungs. It's making us take a deeper breath. When we bend over like that, mm -hmm. or we bend over the desk, we're actually, one, we're getting a stretch into the back of the spine that can become quite tight, but we're also going to open up the lungs in some, some respect. So that's mm -hmm. a really quick thing to do between patients, as long as someone doesn't walk in and see you lying <laughs> on your desk going, oh my goodness me, what a hard day I'm having. Um, if you come and sit in this chair, I, I'll show you a couple of other little mm -hmm. ones. So because we're often facing forward, yep. again, we can find that the front and the back of the body are very active and the sides of the body actually get a bit forgotten about. So it's really easy to just do a, a little spinal twist. So you can just put um, this arm here, This, sorry, bring this arm around there. Mm -hmm. And then just imagine that you're actually twisting from your navel, coming round, your neck's the last thing to come. You don't want to yank the neck round. That's mm -hmm. good. And what you're actually doing is because the lumbar spine <coughs> actually only has five degrees of rotation, the lumbar vertebrae don't rotate much, you're actually bringing a twist to the muscles, really, essentially, and to the inner organs. But that's really nice for the body. Right. So then you repeat it the other side, and, and you can just stretch and feel that. Can you feel that stretch? I definitely can. Yeah. Another way to do that one is to come facing me, is place this hand up on the rib cage, yeah, and then just turn to that side. So you can actually feel a stretch mm. there. That's a, a, an even quicker way of doing it. You can literally just be in and repeat on the other side. It's just, and, and that tactile touch on the rib cage will actually help to, to believe it or not, relax those muscles a little bit when we give ourselves some, some tactile feedback. Do you have any tips for warning signs? Is there anything in particular that you've come across that if people start to feel within their own body, mm, mm. That's, that's the sign to go, you need to do something yeah, now? Yeah. Look, I think, I think there are areas of the, of the body where we can get significant 
issues quite often. One mm. is the lumbar spine. Mm. So if you start to get aching in the lumbar spine, that usually means, hey, move, whether that's from sitting or from any other position, do some stretches. Um, the other area is the, is the neck and shoulders, and we've, dis we've discussed yeah. that. But there's also what I, I, I'll tend to say to people is a sort of like a jammed up feeling or a clamped up feeling. It's often, it's again, this feeling of being very tight and the energy is all up in the upper body. We're feeling tight in the body. That really is a sign, and, and this is where I like those forward bends where we can actually bring some breath back into the body. Um, or just ground ourselves into our feet and just, you know, if it's been a particular heavy day, amazing, we have so many receptors in our feet. Uh, kick the shoes off and just, you know, just let the feet move on the ground and feel into the feet. Can even, and I teach this when I teach the skill of mindfulness, which is a form of meditation, imagine the breath going down to the feet. And you can do three slow breaths, imagining breath into the feet. Bringing this awareness into the body really can have some quite amazing results if we just keep doing it. Or just as simply as becoming aware of where that, that tension mm, is mm. and thinking yeah. just by thought, soften it. Soften, yeah, yeah, soften. I often, interestingly enough, don't use the word relax. You've just said a very good word, which is soften. Mm. Soften is a beautiful word to actually use with the body because the body has lots of soft structures in it. It's, it's not just bones. We can soften, and mm. that's what we need to be able to, you know, we can slump, we can soften. Slumping's fine at times if we've been too rigid. Mm. Do the opposite. Do an opposite action to what's being felt in the body. It's just listening into the body's wisdom. There's plenty of it there. Jane Muirhead there with some good advice and good examples of the kind of stretches and movements that we can do in our daily life. Now, let's talk heavy metal, and I'm not talking music, Olga. No, well, you're not. But one of the things that did strike me was that we're advising all our patients to eat oily fish. Yeah. We're advising our patients to eat more fish, along with all the green veggies that we're also advising them to eat. And then you see a lot of stories about toxic heavy metals, particularly in imported fish. And given that I do a lot of work in inland Australia, where pretty much the only fish that you get on a regular basis is frozen stuff that probably comes from um, someplace Vietnam. in Thailand or Vietnam. Mm. Are we just swapping one problem for another? Are mm. we just telling our patients to eat something stacked with mercury so they'll go bonkers instead of having a heart attack? Well, mercury is the biggest problem in fish and it's less in Australian waters and it's less in smaller, younger fish. So if you're eating shark all the time, you're in trouble. And if you're eating shark that comes from Thailand, you're even more in trouble. But if you're eating sardines out of northern Norwegian waters or southern Australian waters or whiting or something that's small enough for one person to eat for a meal, you're safe as houses. And the other thing is that tin tuna in Australia, here's a plug for the tuna people, and the tin tuna, most of the tuna in the tins is less than a year old, so tin tuna is quite safe as far as mercury is concerned. What about mm. tin salmon? The... Not sure. Right. Not sure. Now, what about these um, patients who go, well, I don't like fish, so I'm taking two or four or six or however many of the recommended doses on the box of fish oil? Jane, do you recommend your patients take fish well, oil? Well, I, I, I was, um, because there, was, there were some studies that saying that it actually um, was helpful for inflammatory conditions and chronic pain, which I treat a lot of as an inflammatory condition. And in the States, I think they were saying a, 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 a gram a day. Um, more recently, I read a few studies, and you'll have to excuse me, I can't remember, um, I can't cite them off the top of my head, that are saying that there's actually not been any evidence to show that it is beneficial yes, for, right. for different conditions and I think the difficulty is is that you know we sort of talk about science as if it's an ab absolutely factual thing but mm. very often you the know, science there can changes. be biased studies <clears throat> there can yeah. be you know different things being mm. looked at in different doses in different amounts of people so you know you'd have to be really um, really quite clued up on that research to know I think the jury probably is, We're still, is out. still out. I, I used to buy it by the 40 gallon drum because that's like a fish oil, a fish, uh, I'm, I'm being facetious, uh, but I used to buy big, big tubs mm. of it and take mm. about 400... Um, 4,000. Yeah, 
That seems to be the dose that people are recommending That's right. is four to eight grams a day. But then and I seem to remember. I know remember the cardiologists used to recommend eight yes, grams they did. a day. But I, then I seem and to remember all the. Then the patients complain of the salmon burps and yeah. don't know what to say. No, no, Norman Swan. Um, not to mention the loose bowels. Yes, a couple of months ago, Norman Swan, who's not a great believer in this kind of stuff anyway, he had somebody on who said that uh, there was no real evidence mm. that it was efficacious. I think the difficulty is, and it's a bit like, um, you know, massive doses of vitamin C and, and, you know, again, there's been studies to say it's really helpful and then other studies say that in, in cancer patients it can, in, you know, speed up the cancer. And I think it's like, you know, would we sit and eat, you know, 20 large salmon a day or, you know, 50 oranges or it comes back to balance. and. It's it's a difficult one, but mm. I think there is also that aspect of we are just sold these ideas of now this is the wonder thing to eat or this is the new yeah you know, the new silver buying bullet our tubs this big and, yeah. and getting the new the silver salmon bullet burps. yeah mm. whereas it, really health is a, a incredibly complex and dynamic process in all of us I think I'm very keen on the whole concept of epigenetics and working out you know what is happening. In Excuse me, could you just explain that term, epigenetics? Epigenetics is really, you know, looking at what switches genes on and off, that they're, they're, we think things are written in our genes, that we've inherited a tendency for X or Y or Z. My mother always got migraines, so I get migraines. But we now know there's this intricate interplay between the environment and the individual, and that certain things will switch on a gene and certain things may well switch that gene off. And this is a big study that's been you know, a big area of, in chronic pain, of what switches certain things on that cause chronic pain in certain conditions and it doesn't switch off. Mm. Do you subscribe to that, Hugh? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned earlier volatile organic compounds and my understanding of these was uh, rather than being ingested that they're given off by plastic solvents, floor varnishes, paint, um, you know, the plastic that surrounds your computer monitor. Drink water bottles. Yes, and drink water bottles. Carpet cleaning materials. And that sort of worries me because a should considerable... We go back one... New should we go back to living in a cave where none you of can. these things exist? <laughs> you can. You know, we all, we all work in offices for That's a considerable right. amount of the day. Our hospitals are all washed down with uh, considerable numbers of uh, nice phenolic compounds. Are we making a toxic environment for ourselves? Yes. What about our, our ability to adapt to our environment and to some of these things in the environment? Doesn't, isn't the body a very efficient organism at, uh, at adapting to these conditions? You're talking about detoxi detoxification. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, and some people things. are better at that than others. So somebody who gets a hangover over two after two glasses of booze is a lousy detoxifier. Somebody who drinks 10 standard <laughs> drinks a day for 30 years and doesn't show and is a very good detoxifier. Mm. You see, the, the body will always keep homeostasis going, but aleostasis, which is the process in which it does that, I mean, homeostasis, we have to have to be alive. Um, and that sometimes gets confused and instead of, well, homeostasis is just keeping nice and balanced. No, the body will go through a whole process of keeping us alive, which can mean that it's, it's working extremely hard with toxins, with bad posture, with stress levels and all sorts of things to, to just keep the organism mm. in a state of being alive. There's a very interesting anecdotal little piece that I would like to give as my husband worked headed up a large organisation and there were people in the building, particularly one floor of the building, who were constantly sick. And these were very, um, you know, he respected their opinions hugely. He went through a lot of testing, spent quite a number of thousands of dollars and water tested, everything tested, came up absolutely clear. Nothing, no sick building, nothing. Um, and after that, people got better. Now, these were there was no illness after that period of time. It petered out. Now, these, are, these were very intelligent people. There may have been some very good reasons why they were getting sick. There may have been a virus that kept passing. Who knows? But there was nothing in the tests that came back. So, again, that doesn't mean there wasn't something going on. That's of true. course there was something going on. It's like the cancer on. clusters at the ABC in Brisbane, which mm. gave rise to the building being demolished mm. and a whole new building being built. All these women got breast yeah. cancer in the newsroom. Exactly, mm. but but we, we don't know mm. we don't know how 
uh, all the variables involved yeah. uh, and, and psychological variables. Well, that's, that's what important. I was getting at. Do, do you think that there's a sort of hysteria at work here? Well, I wouldn't a use the word hysteria. hysteria because I don't, I, 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 but I do think that, that we catch things from one another and it's not just germs. Um, the way we, we react, there's, there's so much evidence now that, you know, some GPs may look at me askance, but really the mind and body are not so very separate. And the fact that we have these inflammatory processes that go on in the brain as well as the body. So I think, I think you know, we need to take all of those things into consideration in mm. illness um, and, and keep that open mind. Mm. We, we influence each other in ways that we don't realise. For instance, women living together in a dormitory will just get their menstruation into sync, for instance. That's right, convicts. Nobody, still nobody knows why, but it happens. Right. It's health for men. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but in convents, apparently, nuns will do that. Or that, mm. will, that will happen to nuns. And I'm university not, halls of residence. Yeah. Mm. I wonder what happens to the men in that circumstance. Well, that's probably time for another program, and I think that's where we will <laughs> leave this one before we get into that particular discussion of what happens when a group of men are get together in a dormitory. <laughs> 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 Best left for another day. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane, thank you for being with us. Hugh, as always, a delight to see you. And Olga, I'm not sure how much of this will actually get on the programme. It could be a very short programme, but I think it was both informative, but it was very entertaining. Yes, I agree. Uh, until we meet again on Rural Doctors, I'm Jerry Gannon. Thanks for your company.